At 10 years old, my normal and somewhat privileged childhood changed overnight. I was in a terrible car accident. My mother and brother were killed. Overnight, I lost my mother, living with my, in a home with my dysfunctional father, his alcoholism, and emotional abuse. Each of these factors by themselves could be harmful to a child, and together they could even have a greater effect. That being said, amazing things started happening. Extraordinary people who you never heard of came into my life. People who added my story to their legacy. In middle school, the Bundys, a normal family, three boys, a mother and a father, a two-story white house, a big yard in the back where all the children came to play. In the evening, they would shoo them away, but everyone had to leave except for me. I got to stay. Not only did I get to stay, they let me go upstairs in the house. Now, who in their right mind would let another middle school boy upstairs in your house? But they did. I started staying the night often over the weekends, and they showed me what a loving family could be. In high school, things continued like they were in middle school until my junior year. And in my junior year, my father got divorced. So in my senior year, I ate dinner almost every night at the Bundy's house. Now, you remember there were three boys, and of the two older boys, I was the smallest of the group. Every evening, we had a Midwestern fare of meat and potatoes and vegetables. Whether we were coming home from practice or work or whatever, there was always an excellent meal for us. And since I was the smallest of the ones eating, that was a lot of food. And they didn't have to do that. At 19, I was coming home from college to work in a clothing store in my hometown. I did that on the weekends and during the holidays. This weekend, my father's new wife decided that my hair was entirely too long and an extremely inappropriate. My father was drunk, which was normal. He was much bigger than me as well, but he had never been physically abusive in my entire life. He grabbed me, threw me down, hit me a few times, yelling for me to fight him. I told him that I wouldn't, or I screamed I wouldn't. He then realized this was pretty ridiculous behavior and got up. Then he said, you can't leave. I said, well, okay. Then he realized that was ridiculous behavior as well. I gathered my things and I left that evening. And I never returned home to live ever again. I went over to the Bundys and then I went to work the next morning. When I came back from work that evening, uh, Mrs. Bundy took me and she said, uh, Johnny, come. I want to show you something. I said, okay. I went with her and, and the, they had had a yarn shop. She had had a yarn shop at the front of their home, very big room up there for many years, but it had closed and they'd cleaned it out and, and everything. And I walked up through the living room and everything to that area with her, and there was a brand new bed there and a side table. And she said, you know, we needed a bed. They needed a bed for the yarn shop? I said, okay. And she told me, she said, it's yours whenever you need it for as long as you need it. Their kindness and generosity 
will never, ever be forgotten. A little bit later, Gaston Nutter, at about this same time, called me in, and he was the owner of the clothing store I'd worked in since I was 16 years old. And he said, I don't want to pay you an hourly wage anymore. I want to pay you a salary for the weekends when you work. I said, okay. And he said, the only provision is you must come straight from practice or class whichever it is you have that day on Fridays, and come here. Now, I'd been doing that for a whole year anyway, so it was nothing different. And he then showed me, he said, well, this is what I want to pay you for each weekend. We're not counting hours. This is what you'll make each weekend uh, for working. It was more than I could have ever made on the very best weekend working hourly for him. After a few months, I was no longer able to continue uh, to do that. I needed to stay at the university and stay at school. But I needed a job. I had to have a job. And uh, I was always associated uh, with golf. The person that I had met and had known for two years had accepted a position in a small public course a few miles from campus, near where I was living. Well, it was February in Indiana. I thought, well, this is a great time to get a job for the new year, right? <laughs> and I called him up, and I said, Bill, you know, I, I need a job, and, and I was hoping that maybe you had something for this year. He told me, he said, I'm sorry, I just filled all the positions. I said, well... I'm sorry as well, but please keep me in mind. And he said he would. Well, the very next day he called. And he said, do you have a job yet? And I said, no, I don't have a job yet. And he said, well, would you, you want to come to the golf course to work? I said, sure, I absolutely do. I said, when do you want me to start? Thinking he was going to say middle of March, you know, something uh, where it wasn't uh, February in Indiana. He said, I want you to start tomorrow when you get out of class. I said, absolutely. So that next day, I drove over from class, pulled into the parking lot of the golf course, Forest Park Golf Course, and his car was the only one in the parking lot, and there was 8 to 10 inches of snow on the ground. There's not much golf being played in 8 to 10 inches of snow. There was one set of footprints from his car to the back door of the pro shop. I looked and I thought, I know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be doing a lot of shoveling of snow. And you know, that was okay. I went into the pro shop and I didn't have to shovel the snow. We got out all the equipment. We got out the sweaters and the shirts and, and all of the supplies. And I cleaned the pro shop, and then I re-cleaned the pro shop for two weeks. We didn't see a single other person there. His example uh, was amazing. He didn't need me when he hired me, and he'll never be forgotten. I cannot explain all of the amazing things that happened in my life. The extraordinary people that were leg up people for me. What is a leg up person? Well, a leg up person is someone who bends at the knees and then they lace their fingers together. Then they ask you to put your foot right in their hands. And then they give you a leg up. Some extraordinary leg up people have changed my life. Over the years, I've reached out and I've thanked them. And, and I've written them letters. And I've called them and told them that what they did changed my life in such a positive way forever. 
As I look out at the audience tonight, and I look at you, each one of you have extraordinary people within your life. People you're thinking about right this minute, their names are going through your mind right now. I implore you, if they're still alive, tonight, tomorrow, you call them, you write them, you reach out to them now. Do not put it off. Say you heard a crazy TED Talk and the guy said you had to do it. <laughs> not only that, don't put it off at all. Recently, I had a, a unique experience. I reached out to my golf coach, the one who got me started as a freshman and sophomore. I was a little guy. And I don't know what he saw in me, what talent or what he saw, or if he just made it up. I don't know. But, you know, he was a... He was someone who I considered to be a personal hero, someone who took extra time, who cared, and showed that he did, and he believed, believed in me. I called him, and now I had gone to thank him years before, but I called him, and I, and I called him, and I said, Donald, I want you to know that I've just recently written a chapter in a book. And in that chapter, uh, I wrote about a personal hero, and you are my personal hero. He thanked me, and he said, Johnny, I am uh, suffering from cancer. And he said, but I'm being treated, and I think I'm doing okay. I said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. But I told him, I said, as soon as the book comes out from the publishers, I'll sign a copy and I'll send it off to you. And we talked a bit more. The book came out from the publishers. I signed a copy. We mailed it off. A few days, few days later, I got a call from his wife. And his wife said, Johnny, we got the book. And she said, Donald's taken a turn for the worse. He knows everybody, but he can no longer talk, and he's in the hospital. He had been a college girls golf coach for many years. He had many visitors, many young people who he'd touched over the years that, that cared deeply. And she told me that he had each and every person who walked in read what I had written about him. Two days later, Donald Bassesi passed away. You never know the timing of your actions. You cannot judge and prejudge when's the right time. As we look and as we think about all of these things and these people, it's important for you to take advantage of the time that you have to reach out right now. Lastly, do not, do not pass up an opportunity because one is going to come right through your path soon. And do not pass up an opportunity to be a leg up person for someone else. It is your opportunity to help and to assist others and, and leave a legacy on them. As your legacy grows, it grows through action. Build your legacy upon a foundation of kindness, caring, gratitude. Appreciate tomorrow. Appreciate those leg up people that have helped you to get to right here to where you are. And be a leg up person for others. Thank you.